just kind of express in a very lighthearted way, we are family here. Uh, one of our great mottos, and it's a drum that we beat continuously, is that we're real people. How many real, real people came to church today? Good, you're home. You're home. You're home. I hope that you brought a Bible with you. If not, it's okay. We've already thought that out. We're going to put it up on the screens, but we're continuing our trek through the Gospel of Mark. What a great set of meditations by our brother Kirk this morning, and I love what Kirk brings to the table. It's always thoughtful and insightful, and long after the service is over, I'm chewing, I'm gnawing on that, Kirk, when I'm driving home, so thank you, brother, for that. Uh, we are continuing our trek through the uh, Gospel of Mark. Uh, last week, if you were with us, uh, Jesus sent his 12 out two by two, and so we know up until that point, Jesus is the lead, as he is, uh, in world, in the life, in the universe, and, uh, and Jesus is the lead, he's the primary person, they're helping him, and then last week, he, he uh, gives them authority, he sends them out two by two, remember we talked about how he, he sent them out with just basically nothing to take for the trip, none of the stuff that, that we would think, boy, we would just already get a packing list together, and we'd stop at the ATM, and we'd go get toiletries up at the Target, and boy, we'd be all ready for a journey with so many question marks and open ends, and yet Jesus said, man, just take the gospel, my authority, and a walking stick. Take a staff with you, that's what I'll allow, and your suitcase, and, uh, and, and that's it. And they come back, and they are just absolutely losing their mind. God, we, we got to experience things. Jesus, how amazing was that? And what we find here in Mark chapter 6 is a bit of a sandwich. How many of you like a good sandwich? Okay, well, that was a good ovation, by the way. Uh, yeah, nothing wrong with a great sandwich, right? You kind of have the bread, and then you got, uh, for, for you vegans, uh, whatever you put in that. And uh, how many of you like the ham? How many of you like the, uh, yeah, yeah, mo uh, that's okay. And if you're a vegan, we love you. And uh, 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 but there's two slices of bread. They're, they're couched between two slices of bread. And we kind of see this in the makeup of Mark chapter 6. Uh, we see that it begins one way, and then there is this story that we're talking about today, and then it kind of wraps up again, kind of comes full circle with the apostles coming back again. But today, we're going to be talking about a piece of scripture that you're probably familiar with, but I want to kind of take it apart today. I want to take the sandwich apart today, kind of deconstruct it, and, and for us to look at this, and, and, and just right up front, my disclaimer, this is probably not going to be a happy, clappy kind of a sermon. Uh, it's kind of sobering. Uh, it's not the greatest narrative to just kind of start a revival in a church, but I believe it's necessary, and I believe it's necessary, and I very, think it's very timely, especially in lieu of the climate that we're finding ourselves as Americans, and specifically Christian Americans. So with that said, with that little preamble, uh, I would invite you, if you can, to please stand, and we're going to read this text together. All right, ready? Here we go. King Herod heard about this, for Jesus' name had become well known. Some were saying, John the Baptist has been raised from the dead, and that is why miraculous powers are at work in him. Others said, he is Elijah, and still others claim he's a prophet, like one of the prophets of long ago. But when Herod heard this, he said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised from the dead. For Herod himself had given orders to have John arrested, and he had him bound and put in prison. He did this because of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, whom he had married. For John had been saying to Herod, it's not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. So Herodias nursed a grudge against John and wanted to kill him. And so she was not able to, because Herod feared John and protected him, knowing him to be a righteous and holy man. And when Herod heard John, he was greatly puzzled, yet he liked to listen to him. Finally, the opportune time came. On his birthday, Herod gave a banquet for his high officials and military commanders and the leading men of Galilee. When the daughter of Herodias came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his dinner guests. The king said to the girl, ask me for anything you want, and I'll give it to you. And he promised her with an oath, whatever you ask, I will give you up to half my kingdom. She went out and said to her mother, what shall I ask for? The head 
of John the Baptist, she answered. At once, the girl hurried to the king, into the king with the request, I want you to give me right now the head of John the Baptist on a platter. The king was greatly distressed, but because of his oaths and his dinner guests, he did not want to refuse her. So he immediately sent an executioner with orders to bring John's head. The man went, beheaded John in the prison, and brought back his head on a platter. He presented it to the girl, and she gave it to her mother. On hearing of this, John's disciples came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. God bless you. You may be seated. Can I just kind of give a little soundtrack to the end of that? What? Now get him fired up, talking about a decapitation. Now what in the world? Again, this is not really great fodder for Fodder's Day. And, uh, you know, talking about this, and, and some of us would say, wait, that's the same John who was like, you know, announced, he had a, had a supernatural angelic birth announcement. That's the same John who, who always knew that he would be filled with the Holy Spirit and what his mission in life would be to make straight the paths of the Lord. That was the same John that we find later on standing waist deep in the Jordan River with this crazy uniform that he wears and this crazy diet that he eats and, and he's calling all these people to repentance and he, he's calling all these hires up like sh- you know brood of vipers and things like that. John gets his head cut off because of a stripper? Not exactly fair. He's a good guy. Who'd he ever hurt? He's just being obedient. Why, why that? It's hard to get people excited when you read a text like that. But as I mentioned, I think this text is timely for us. One of my heroes of the faith, uh, he's not found in the Bible, though many are, is a fellow by the name of Jim Elliott. That's Jim Elliott right there. Jim was a fellow who, in January 1956, lost his life with four of his missionary buddies to the very, very people that he was trying to reach with the gospel, the Alka Indian tribe of a very remote Ecuador. They lost their life to these people. These people didn't know why they were coming, this very primitive group. And, and yet they, they were speared in the riverbed. Life magazine sent in a crew and found them all. They were all speared and laying in the sand. But what's so heroic about, about Jim Elliott is, is this quote, and he said, he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. Wow. I would love to be remembered for something that elegant and and that true. What was he saying here? Long before that losing his life, he said, man, I'm already losing my life. And and, and what do I have to lose? What do I have to lose? See, because I, 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 I gained the world. I gained the world. How heroic. To face that, to, to be that driven and, and to face that. I, I think about one of my, another hero, a German pastor and theologian by the name of Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Dietrich was brilliant, came from a, a family of scholastics. They were all kind of let down when he went to chase theology. His dad was a world-renowned psychologist. And, and he pursued theology and was brilliant, Matter of fact, he went all over the world, even ended up in New York City, and yet he he heard about the rise of this fellow back in his homeland who was raising all kinds of different kind of religion and different kind of allegiance and and anti-Semitism in its wings. And instead of staying in New York and where he was celebrated, he gets on a boat and he goes back to Germany. And one morning, early morning, in the Flossberg prison, he's executed. His last words, they're they're awesome. This is the end of me, the beginning of life. Dietrich Bonhoeffer and his master work, The Cost of Discipleship, is quoted. 
He says, when Christ calls a man, he bids him to come and die. I'd never see that on the back of a bumper sticker or on a car. <laughs> Nobody's got that on a t-shirt. You know, we like to put really catchy things up there, you know, and in case of the rapture, you can make my car payments, you know, really cutesy things like that. <laughs> but I've never seen any Jesus witness where that says, come and die. And yet, not only did he believe that, preach that, write that, but he lived that. How about Rachel Scott and Cassie Bernal, two honor students in 1999 at Columbine High School, that when faced with the end of a gun barrel and, and asked to, to renounce their faith, neither would recant and lost their young lives, and became national heroes and inspirations to countless Americans. I think of Martin Luther, the great reformer. He was a lowly monk, guy that played well, and, and then he gets a copy of Scripture for himself, and he begins to read the Bible with his own eyes, and he reads Romans. And he begins to notice things that don't line up with his faith. And he takes those 95 differences, not to be a rebel, but he just wanted somebody above him to, to explain these things, and 95 things, and he, he takes them and he nails them to the, to the Wittenberg Castle Gate. And boy, did it begin a firestorm. And he stands before the most important holy person of his time, Charles V, the Holy Roman Emperor. And here, surrounded by superiors, he is told that he is to recant everything that he has learned, specifically from the book of Romans. It messed him up in the most beautiful kind of way. And what's awesome is, is that when he was told to, to recant, you know it. Maybe you saw the movie or depictions of it. He says, I cannot and will not recant because it is neither safe nor wise to act against conscience. Here I stand. I can do no other. God, help me. Amen. Wow. You know why we are, most of us, Protestants today? It's because this guy, when he was faced with certain expulsion and death, said, I can't recant. I can't pretend I don't know what I, what I know. And with immense courage, he said that he could not. Fox's Book of Martyrs, it's a classic work. Maybe you have a copy of it. And in it, though it's a parabiblical resource, it outlines and it describes each one of the 12 apostles. Did they go retire somewhere, put their feet up, wiggle their tootsies in the sand? Each one of them eventually faced tremendous persecution and lost their lives in various countries in various, various ways. Hmm. Amazing. Amazing exhibitions of faith, right? Amazing, when, when it came down to it, when it came to a choice, when it came to a left or the right, and, and no other turn that you can make, when people were looking, when people were not looking, all of the examples and countless numbers more made the decision, I will not denounce my allegiance to Jesus Christ. I will not surrender. It's amazing. You know, when we hear of stories like that, I think we as Christians, especially American Christians, I think we do a couple of things. The first thing we do is we dismiss it. We dismiss it, don't we? Because that's so foreign to us. And yet, we oftentimes are, are so oblivious to this, how many Christians are suffering around the world, even today. You know why? Simply because they're Christians. Simply because they're Christians. See, all of this is spiritual in nature. And, and these very, very brave Christians, many who you'll never meet, someday you will, are laying down their life, are facing incredible, pointed opposition to recant their faith. I, I just heard this fact as I was researching this. More Christians have died already in the 21st century than in the first 20 centuries combined. According to Christianity Today, there are right now 40 nations rated as very high when it comes to Christian persecution. That'll be 45 by the end of 2022. Five countries with the highest 
average of Christian persecution? I'm so glad that you asked. Yemen, Libya, Somalia, North Korea, Afghanistan. At this point, when I share facts like that, here in our nice air-conditioned sanctuary, we hope you're comfortable. We want you to feel comfortable. We want you to feel valued. We want you to, to be at home. And when I share things like that, or somebody else shares things like that, don't we just kind of, just kind of dismiss that? That could never happen here. Are you kidding me? All the freedoms that we have? Why in the world? I, you know, that happened for people back in Bible times. That happens for people across the ocean and in places that, that haven't met Jesus yet. But we're Ameri- I mean, there's, we're, we're on church row. You can throw a rock and hit a church, and then throw a rock from there and hit another church. And, and that could never happen here, right? And friends, I'm here to, to let you know that it's time for the church to wake up. We have been lulled into this amnesia. We have been lulled into thinking. That is for other people in other places at other times. And I would encourage you, because I love you, look at the headlines. Steve, that's so depressing. Look at the headlines. It's coming, lest I say it's here. We've got to pick a team. We've got to pick a side. The days of somehow straddling a proverbial fence is is over. We We have to take a stand for right. It's all sliding. I don't want to sound like my grandfather, but is there anybody else beside the guy with a Bible above his head right now that says, I don't recognize America anymore? Three honest people. I don't I don't recognize it anymore. I don't even know what to say anymore. I don't want to turn this political, but man, we're killing our babies. I know some of you have, at different times in your life, that that was a decision, and and nobody's piling on, dog piling on right now. There's only grace if that's you. If you had an abortion, if you financed an abortion, there's only love, grace, and forgiveness from the Lord. But it's on our shores. It's not for people far away. It's it's here. It's here. Do you know what I'm doing right now? Some of you are saying, we have no idea what you're doing right now. Uh, You've been here three years. We still don't know what you're doing. Before, I I believe this. This is not some Nelly negative Nelly stuff. I believe what I'm doing right now, before too long. It's all moving there. This will be labeled hate speech. We're going to pull your 501c tax-free status unless we preview what you're going to say on Saturday. And oh, by the way, we'll have a recording or maybe a person live who will be listening to every word, including the word that Kirk just said, including the words in the songs. Dude, it's all going there. It's all going there. And so what I'm trying to say as we take from this, this text today is, again, this is not just for those, those poor people over there that we just, well, let's just pray for them. Yes, pray for them. But wake up. It's on our shores. It's, it's, it's here. And so when we hear these things, the first thing is just to dismiss it. But I believe there's a second thing that happened, and don't tell me this one doesn't land, is we begin to ask ourselves questions. Could I do it? If it came down to it, could, could I do? Could I do what Cassie Bernal did? Could I, could I do what, what Pastor Bonhoeffer did? Could I do it at the end of the day? Could I do that? Could I stand there and make my back like a T-rail and dig in my heels and, and, and say, God bless me, I, I'm not going to recant, I'm not giving in, and face the consequences of that? Could I do that? Could I pay the ultimate price? I'll come back to that. I'll circle around to that in just a minute. When we read chronologically, if we look at the Gospels, John the baptizer was the very, very first person in the New Testament who laid his life down for Jesus. Isn't that amazing? Piece of trivia. If you're playing Bible trivia, that'll probably get you, I don't know, six moves. I don't know. 
But he was the very, very first one to lay, lay down his life. What I want to do is just very, very quickly, in the time I have left you with you, I want to give you three expectations that we can take out of the text today that are very, very practical. You need to see yourself in the, in the message today. Here's the first expectation if you're taking notes, is expect others to be confused about Jesus. Expect it. In our text today, they were confused about him. His, his reputation was growing. Here Jesus is going from village to village. He's preaching. He's preaching about the kingdom. And now, man, he is more than multiplying. Now he is like giving authorization to these 12. And now it's not only Jesus, but man, now it's these six missionary teams that are going all over the place. In the name of Jesus and the power of Jesus is going everywhere now. And that's where our text picks up. Now, this is not Herod the Great that we're talking about in our text today. Herod the Great was, was a pretty crazy guy, brilliant guy, cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs. This is one of his sons. This is Herod Antipas. Herod Antipas, Herod was more of a title than a, a name. He was over the Galilean region, so he would have been very aware of this name and, and the proliferation of this name. Jesus' popularity is growing. Who is he? Who is he? Antipas says, man, it's, it's, it's John who I had beheaded. Man, he, he rose from the dead. Man, he was really, really prophetic. He stood in the river, and man, he was gutsy. And boy, this same Jesus, man, he's standing up to Pharisees and, and other people like that. So he's got to be John resurrected. Some would say, no, no, he's, he's, he's Elijah. See, Elijah, his ministry was filled with miracles. And so this is Elijah back to say hello again. And others said, no, no, he's a, he's a prophet. He's got to be a prophet, a new prophet of some type. And so they're playing family feud, top response. And, and you know, they're trying to figure it out. They're trying to figure out who Jesus really, really is. They're stumped by him. They're confused by him. Friends, let me remind you that people are still confused about Jesus today. They're very, very confused. They don't know what you know. They don't know what you know. They know he's important. They just don't know why. They know he's somehow connected with God, but what? Who is he? Who is he? Why did he come? What has he done? What's all that business about the cross? That's gruesome. What's all that business that we see around Easter time where... There's this tomb, I guess, he was in, and they're saying that it's empty now. What, what's this business with Jesus? I, I hear his name a lot, typically when somebody's really frustrated. <laughs> Who is he? Who is this Jesus? And let me tell you, a huge part of our mission is to love others enough to tell them. It's huge. It's huge. See, if we don't love people first, we'll never tell them about Jesus. And I think that's part of the problem. Is that you've got to love people more than you fear them in order to reach them. Somebody needs to get that today. We've got to fear people, love people more than we fear people. But right now we live in a culture where we're so walled off, we don't even know our neighbors anymore. We go into our garages, and, and it goes down. And, and we don't have to go out in there in the highways and the byways. And you get your groceries delivered to you, and you can bank online for crying out loud. You don't have to go know who a teller is. I mean, you can. And we become so insulated and isolated. A huge part is, is us telling them, us filling in the blanks. For instance, who is Jesus. Friends, Jesus is the eternal Son of God who left heaven and came to earth as a man. That's Jesus. Why did Jesus come? Jesus came to seek and to save the lost like you and me, those who were separated from God by our sins. What has Jesus done? Jesus died on a cross to pay the penalty for our sins so that we could be forgiven and that we could begin a relationship with him. There's not one person here or watching online that could not share those things with someone else. This is who Jesus really, really is. But listen, even after all that explanation, guess what? You can still expect confusion. 
You're going to have those who are going to say, that just sounds too far out, man. You're going to have some that are going to say, sounds way too good to be true. Or you're going to have some people who are going to say, you know what? They just dismiss it and reject it. And here's my advice to you. Tell them anyway. Tell them anyway. Because it's the most important thing that you can share with somebody is who Jesus Christ really, really is. And as we talked about last week, that's one of the ways, one of the most important ways that we bring God glory is by sharing the gospel with other people. And so expect others to be confused about Jesus. Again, they don't know what you know, right? And guess who God put on the planet? To love, save, and to tell other people about how good he is. You. Here's the second expectation. Expect to be persecuted for confronting sin. Expect to be persecuted for confronting sin. John the baptizer was arrested and imprisoned by Herod Antipas. Why? Because he called Herod Antipas out. The gal you're married to shouldn't be married to her. Now, wouldn't it have been so much easier for John the Baptist to say, you know what, let's just pray for him. <laughs> let's, let's send him a track or two. Let's, let's send him a, a, a few verses. But John the Baptist, John the Baptist confronted him on it. In Scripture, we find other examples of King David being confronted. Sometimes, how many know God will love you enough sometimes to send somebody to you to confront you on something? Sometimes it's the most loving thing. Sometimes it's the most loving thing you can pray. God, help him get caught. Some of us go off on tangents, and the only way that we're going to stop, that progression is going to be arrested, is if somebody comes and stands directly in our face. And here, John the Baptist, with all he had going on, his ministry, he has disciples, he's, he's a busy guy. He's not just sitting around thinking, who can I pick on? But he sees there is something wrong, and nobody's addressing it. And he confronts it. He recognized that he's light in a dark world. And he addresses this. And Herod says, man, I'm going to protect this guy. I like this guy. This is a holy man. I love to listen to him. You should get his tape series. He's really good. Diet is really weird. But his wife doesn't like him. She's got a grudge. She's holding a grudge. She's looking for an opportune time. And boy, does she get that time. Friends, the gospel is offensive. The gospel is offensive. The good news is, is that Jesus died for sinners. The bad news is, you're a sinner. We don't like that part. I really love the part where Jesus came and Jesus died on the cross, and he did all my heavy lifting. But I don't want to deal with the I'm a sinner person. Because I want to sit on the throne of my life. I don't want to abdicate the throne of my life. I want to make my own decisions. See, if I acknowledge there's a God, then that means that I'm going to have to be responsible to this God. And though as Paul says, I can look at the natural world and know there's a God, James says even the demons know there's a God and they shudder. We don't even shudder anymore. That there is a God. We just don't want to be accountable to him. Paul says, man, we, we run from the truth. We run from God. What did Adam and Eve do? Huh? Huh? Right? <laughs> we run from God. We run from the truth. But notice that he stood up to them. See, when you stand for right, and you stand for truth, you will be persecuted. But what's Jesus say? How do you respond to that? 
oh, they don't like me. I want to be liked. I want to get picked for the softball team. They don't like me. What did Jesus say? And when you stand for right, like I stood for right, like John the Baptist stood for right, Jesus said, blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you. Happy. Happy. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice. Be glad. (laughs) Because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. You're in good company. And the evidence that you're doing the right thing is you're getting some persecution for it. They were trying to fit in too much. They were trying to win prom awards for being likable and <laughs> congeniality. Expect others to be confused about it. Do you expect to be persecuted for confronting sin? Here's the last one. I expect a huge amen on this one. Expect to pay the ultimate price. Really? You got the gift of martyrdom? That's the one you want, right? Uh, like, man, I'd like to take one of those spiritual gift assessments, but what if, what if martyrdom is my number one gift? I don't know. John the Baptist paid the ultimate price. And here's where our humanity comes in. That's not fair! That's not fair! Gabriel, the same one that made Jesus' birth announcement, made his birth announcement. That's not fair. He stood in a river. He he was defined. He was consecrated. He never drank any alcohol. He, 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 He didn't deserve that. Did you ever find yourself in that situation? You ever had somebody that was dying, somebody that you loved, and it just wasn't fair? They lived such a good life, Lord. They did this in the church, and this in the church, and they did this, and it's not fair. And let me remind you as the landing gear comes down, when in the world has fair been the measuring stick? Do you get fair in a fallen world? And if we're going to use the measuring stick of fair, is it fair that the second member of the triune would leave his place of adulation, step over the precipice of eternity and glory, step onto a planet in which he would be mocked and ultimately crucified. Is that fair? (laughs) See, if fair is fair, if we're going to play by the measuring stick, the, the flat line of fairness, that means that each one of us deserve to go to hell. It ain't fair. And that's the beautiful thing about grace. It's so much better than fair. It's you and me getting what we don't deserve. How awesome is that? I'm reminded in times like this, man, I don't deserve to be in this room. And don't look at me so religious, neither do you. I don't deserve to have the hope I have. Neither do you. This is the beauty of grace. This is what grace is all about. Is that no matter who you are, no matter what you've done, you can come and you can be a part of this. Some are going to have to die to self. Some are going to have to die to sin. And yes, reality tells us some will have to die physically. Tertullian, one of the famous second century church fathers, said that the the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. We see that with Stephen in in the book of Acts. This young guy, all the the potentiality in the world, in the middle of a church crisis, a potential church split, because there seems to be a perception that the Grecian widows are not getting as much as the Hebrew widows, and there's a lot of chatter and talk. Not that we would ever experience anything like that in the church, but there was this turmoil that was going on in the church, and and, and they go to the apostles, and the apostles say, listen, we can't take our eyes off the ball. We need to pray. We need to preach the word. Uh, You guys pick for yourself some guys, and, and they need to be filled with the Holy Spirit and with wisdom, and you go take care of that crisis. And guess what? It worked, and one of those guys was Stephen. Next time we find Stephen, he's in Acts chapter 7. 
and he is defending his faith. We know the rest of the story. He dies an excruciating death. As he's dying, as stones are being pummeled upon him, he looks up and he sees a vision. The heavens are open and he sees Jesus standing at the right hand of the Father. It is in his dying breath he forgives the people who are hurling stones at him. And if we just look at that at surface level, we think, man, that's horrible. This young guy, this up-and-comer, this amazingly powerful young man who is articulate and filled with faith, man, he, he died so needlessly. But you know what was happening? Is that the church was growing. It was exploding in Jerusalem. But Jesus said, go into all the... I said, somebody, go into what? All the world. And all they are is they're becoming a mega church in Jerusalem. But now with the persecution of Stephen, guess what? They are running for their lives all over the Roman Empire. And guess what they're taking with them? The gospel. And so one of the worst things that ever happened in the church is the death of a young man named Stephen. You know what one of the best things that happened in the church was? The stoning of Stephen. Would you lay down your life? Would you lay down your life? Could you do that? Some of us, again, on a Sunday morning, it's just hypothecation, isn't it? I'm not sure if I could or not. But I think we can catch a glimpse of what decision you would make. If you ask yourself the question, and I think it's important, are you living a sacrificial life right now? That's a good indicator. Have you given up smaller things? To follow Jesus. See, if you won't lay down smaller things, how in the world are you going to lay your life down for Jesus? So I think we can get a little bit of a glimpse of the decision we would make individually. Paul gives us the key. It's in Galatians 2.20. Paul says at the very, very beginning of this beautiful sentence, I've got it in my office, I have been crucified with Christ. Paul's saying, I'm dead. I'm already a goner. I'm already a goner. See, I'm not going to fight for my rights. I'm not going to fight for my ambition. I'm not going to fight for all of my dreams. I've already been crucified with Christ. You can't hurt a dead guy. And so therefore, my life is no longer my own. And so therefore, I'm not going to protect it. I'm not going to hide it. I'm already a goner. I've laid down my life for Jesus. Have you done that? Are you dead yet? Maybe that's why we hang on so tightly to this world, our dreams and what we want to get out of this world. But you see, when we lay down our life voluntarily, when we do that every single day, not just one time like our brother did this morning in a, in a watery baptistry, but, but when we do that every single day, we lay down our lives, we pick up our cross, we deny ourselves. If that day would come, you'll know what to do. You'll know what to do. Friends, as your friend and your pastor, I pray you never have to make that decision. I pray not. But it's on our shores. And it's coming. This is not the time to be weak and mealy mouth. This is the time to pick a team, choose a jersey, and go all the way. Are you? Will you? That's the only dedication that God will take. Will we find it in you? Will we find it in this room? Will we find it in this church? I pray. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you laid it all down for us. Give us the courage to be willing to lay it all down for you. Our rights, our hopes, our dreams, our agendas, our to-do lists, our priorities, our, 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 Lord. 
decimate ours, eradicate our part of the equation, help us to lose ourselves, help us to die to ourselves. Because you alone are worthy. Father, help us to remember that that's a decision that happens not just one time, but that happens every single day. Help us to be those kind of people. Help us to live those kind of lives. That the name of Jesus might be glorified. We pray this, Father, for your glory and in your name. Amen. If you have a decision to make, why not make it now as we stand together and we sing?